Hello everyone, happy Sunday. Welcome to Dwell On It, episode 32. And I wanna quickly address a few things. One, get ready for me to be playing with my hair all the time. I know it's flying out already. Two, I hear my voice and it's not because of a sandwich this time. Three, in a few moments, I would like to pay my respects to an individual who recently passed away. And four, I'm not gonna be using the grab bag this time because I'm gonna have an episode that's very similar to something that was near the end of September, if I remember correctly, when I was on an episode of Face to Face. And, uh, the follow-up after that, I chose to acknowledge questions or comments or remarks or whatever it may be on social media when I would be amplifying messaging here and there. And in this case, very similarly, this episode is going to be acknowledging some of those questions, comments, feedback, etc., etc., and also just some anecdotal conversations that just make for a good time to pile in. Uh, the, the primary topic is actually addressing a campaign that I sent out last week regarding Sport Manitoba and Bison Transport. As a whole, the Sport Manitoba and Bison Transport have an excellent program in, in the sense of um, of empowering women to be leaders in, in sport and community and for themselves. And <laughs> there's that voice. And, and the reason why it's a concern is that there was an episode um, that was about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I was recommended to, you know, to, to register and take it in. And fundamentally, the episode is fine. However, there's a promo, an ad right near the beginning that the best way to explain it would be with toxic positivity. Hey, the world is fantastic. Don't don't worry, we got you. Yeah, nah. Right? And, and that's one of the challenges when it comes to promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion is that the, the messaging must be mindful and responsible. And unfortunately, it was a very irresponsible set of messages. Now, if that wasn't discussed, there's not much to talk about. But this concern was actually aired. This concern was actually brought forward during the live event, right, by questioning. And second, this actually was also brought up after the, the, uh, the episode was done in a follow-up conversation and was still being like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, and then still promoted after the fact without looking into it further. That is a concern, and that is when I decided to amplify this this issue because unfortunately diversity, equity, and inclusion, you're speaking to marginalized and vulnerable communities. And so you need to be mindful about the experience of marginalized and vulnerable people. And that said, if you're going to continue promoting the concept of listening, when someone who is coming from one of those communities is saying that, hey, your messaging is harmful and should not be amplified and go, oh, okay, cool. And still do that is not listening, right? Right. You'll see more details as things come along. I'm trying to be concise with the intro. Uh, there's going to be a link or two or three, I haven't decided yet, in the body of the description to go along with the regular spiel. That's just gonna give some, you know, where you can review this yourself if you have not seen it yet from, uh, you know, from your inbox yourself or a text or whatever it may be. So that is addressed, like I said, hair flying <laughs> voice. I was trying to sing earlier, right? That's, uh, it's, you know, karaoke, having fun with that. And now I'd like to pay my respects. This is time to get serious. A coworker passed uh, last week and I would like to just take a moment to Acknowledge, uh, acknowledge that, and I want to um, offer my condolences to uh, obviously the workplace, especially considering that with me working from home, there are many people who work much closer, right? Even remotely, but still, just by the nature of their jobs, that they are um, a, a close and close knit community within themselves. I've been at this workplace for ten and a half years, I think, is something I've said before, but around there, and I've known this person since. Uh, since I started. So like I said, the co-workers, I certainly have um, my condolences to, obviously to the family, and uh, even the people who have dealt with this individual on a regular. Um, to be mindful, just uh, considering, you know, my audience and, the, you know, on both positive and negative sides that I do try to be mindful about who I'm speaking of. Normally, <laughs> normally death doesn't get to me. And, and I can also say, like, death isn't getting to me in principle. You, 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 you live and then you die. <laughs> I'm, I'm really fun at parties, by the way. <laughs> but, um, one, one thing that really stuck out with me with, with this individual is, um, before I just take a moment to talk about some of the, some of the things that just made them fantastic was when I came out to the workplace. I've said before how the, the worst thing that I've ever received in, in terms of hostility from the workplace was nothing, right? So if people chose to ignore me, that is literally the worst that I've ever experienced. And that's, you know, could be a lot worse compared to all of the other options of transphobia and bigotry and hate and so on. And in this case, one thing that really, really sticks out to my mind, and especially when I was still like, even though when I came out, of course, I, I had no choice but to accept myself. 
And even then, there's lots of lingo and jargon that were still difficult for me to accept. You know, even when it just comes to the lexicon of using words like, you know, girl and so on, where it's, it's sometimes it still kind of gets to me in, in a very, oh yeah, sort of way when, you know, I'd, I'd get a text from someone and, and be like, you go girl, or, you know, such and such. And, and, and again, as I mentioned, that's just part of my lexicon. I've never use that and even when you you you, like everyone who's followed me for as long as you have right and and known me as long as you have i don't usually use that type of language anyway so you know i'm I'm not all like you know yas or queen or whatever (laughs) it's like periods are typically the end of my sentences because like i said i'm super fun at parties and one thing that really sticks out with me with this individual i remember that was it was something about an email whatever it was some something work related and um to to just get a something like the, along the lines of right you go girl or or something like that and 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 that meant a lot because I was still struggling with 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 just like growing into myself at the time and to to to, to have this person be miles ahead of me and accept me before I'm still accepting me is is something that I I hope people understand. Uh, I hope people understand how powerful that is with, um, not everyone does that. It takes a huge person to be able to do that. This, um, this person was an absolutely beautiful soul. And, um, just like every other human being, everyone's got their ups and downs. Like the one thing that, at least with my work experience, is that he knew when to park it at the door whether he knew that his smile was infectious or it was just a fantastic byproduct of him being a, a, an amazing an amazing person that's one of the biggest things literally that i can remember about him is that that smile could light up a room his his compassion his cheer and and his concern many times um anybody from work who hears this um would already have a laugh <laughs> if you know if 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 I say that every customer is his best customer, because that's how it always was. And sometimes, sometimes it was enough to be an eye roll because, you know, it, you know, trying to dial in a favor and it's like, you know, I need this. These are my best customers. I was like, but you, those are your best customers. You were just telling me about two hours ago. So pick. <laughs> but every customer was his best customer because he, he legitimately cared. He was a very passionate and, and um, considerate individual. And, and what, what's really sticking out with me is uh like i said that email he wasn't the only person from the workplace to you know be be accepting and inclusive um many people in the workplace um honestly just it, it made me feel so welcome by you know just just looking looking past the uh the the, the social awkwardness clearly and, and even getting other emails from other individuals or texts or phone calls or whatever it may be about how the 2s lgbtqia plus community has a value in their lives whether it's somebody that they know something they know personally something they believe in um or or just being an ally or however it goes and and like I said it's one of one of the biggest things that 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 stands out was just remembering that email and and and, and the, the meaningfulness of that was that he loved me before I loved me and 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 like I've, I've said in episodes in the past that me taking steps to go into trans health care and so on and coming out was was representing self-love but there was still a lot of hesitation about my own pride like when i when i came out i came out because it's something i had to do i had to do for me and i had to do for the world around me and there was still like a lot of conflict even though there's still lots of times that i just had that mental clarity and so on and all those other great things it still doesn't take away from the fact that there'd be days that i would just be questioning my own self and, and not my own validity or my own worth but just kind of like getting more like comfortable and he beat me to it that's what really stands out I'm gonna miss him. My, my, my workplace relationship with others is relatively independent just by what I do as a data analyst. I don't need to be, you know, in the middle of everything with everyone else. It was just, it was always, always, always saying hello to everyone. And he, he just made the days better. And, and like coming from somebody who hated waking up every day and and like and and I would show up to the office with a mood. I was a mood, <laughs> and I'm sure again anyone who hears this uh, knows that that I certainly was a mood. He fixed it. 
even though sometimes I wouldn't show it because I was that much of a mood, but his casual efforts would still bring a smile. I, I'm really grateful for the time that I was able to share um, in the workplace with him. And I hope that uh, everyone is able to have a healthy grieving process, are able to grieve in ways that they find comfort. And, and if there's anything that I can advise, just take your time as, as you need when it comes to grieving, because uh, grieving is a process, not a procedure. And I'm um, gonna miss him. I absolutely despised his dad jokes. And it was even worse when there was another individual in the workplace who, uh, when they sat beside each other, they were of a similar age, and it was this nexus of just absolutely terrible <laughs> dad jokes happening, and uh, and I couldn't be happier to be around it when it would when it would go on. Anecdotally, um, one one thing that I remember very much and appreciated very much about him was. Um, I typically ran uh, like hockey or sports pools um, in a, in a pre-COVID era, and uh, I was always very excited to um, to participate with that, and not not just only with the sports pools, but also with my own um, campaigning when it comes to Run for Women. Um, I believe off the top of my head that he's been a regular contributor since um, the uh, since I started. <laughs> Um, campaigning with uh, uh, with Run for Women. Those uh, contributions will be sorely missed. Um, and what, what, what that means to me is that his passion to participate with things that were important to me um, really stand out, and I hope people recognize that subtext. He was participating in things that I was passionate about. And think about even what I said about that email, that I was passionate about finally being happy, and he took that step forward to be like, I support you. So to hear of his passing, um, it, 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 got to my memory. And, uh, and and like I said, typically death doesn't get to me. <laughs> and, and like I assure you that by the time this episode is done, right, I'm going to carry on with my day still. But to have a moment to reflect on how positive he was to me, it, it's worth acknowledging. And so like I said, my condolences to the family, to the workplace. Sometimes that says to both. My workplace is a large workplace and it's an even larger family. So when, when I do say family, that goes all together in terms of everyone who was important to, uh, to him. So uh, I do hope that he is able to rest peacefully and powerfully, that everybody who is grieving about his loss is able to find comfort and find inspiration from the type of person who he was. So I don't drink, but this is a great time for everybody who does drink to have something and... Just make sure to take a toast to a very, very special, a very meaningful individual who made every individual around him meaningful. As I mentioned, I am not going to use the grab bag this time, but please continue bringing those questions. I hope that this part is going to bring a little bit of humor. I wish to lead this off. I was able to share the same emotion of this message, but I'm not going to fake it. <laughs> this is hopefully just going to help transition things to a much more positive attitude. Pardon the pun. Were you the trans woman who asked O'Toole the question during the election? That's so awesome. Yes, that was. That was me. So I am so happy that I continue to get recognized from individuals that I did happen to be on CBC The Nationals face-to-face, -face, uh, speaking to Aaron O'Toole. Uh, my topic being, of course, bigotry and transphobia. I'll put a link to it as well, so please check it out. And it won't be a link to the episode specifically. It'll be a link to a follow-up that I had about that. The description of that video actually has links straight to the episode too, whether it was the edited version on The National or the full episode that got posted on CBC's website. As, as proud as I am of having the opportunity to, to be on that stage, even for as few minutes as it was and as few sentences as I was able to say, I do feel that ultimately my visibility was mishandled by the CBC and uh, I did air grievances about that. So you can hear those grievances and there were many, many more grievances that were aired via email between myself and individuals from CBC. Uh, so much so that CBC's ombudsman is going to be doing a review on it as he catches up. 
that I know that at the time of our last conversation, he had 27 concerns in front of him. And so, of course, it is going to take a small while, but feel free to take a look and you will see a follow up on that. I believe that the ultimate conclusion that the ombudsman likely will end up saying is going to be something along the lines of there wasn't a violation of journalists and broadcast standards. I, I believe that. I agree with that. Nothing egregious happened. At the same time that the watering down, the, you know, the, the kind of like to, to, to create my visibility to be more palatable for, you know, Joe Canadian really did not help the messaging of eliminating bigotry and transphobia. So I believe strongly that the messaging will end up being in that neighborhood. As a matter of fact, to be transparent, the conversation that I had with the ombudsman, and I said, that I was like, I'm not looking for a win. I'm looking for visibility. I'm looking for awareness to the situation. I'm not looking for somebody to side with me, but I'm looking for somebody to recognize that what I've been saying is valid and to amplify that. And I believe that is kind of where things are going to end up looking. I'm curious to see how his um, dialogue will um, will end up being with that. But ultimately, like I said, that had a few conversations. It's definitely seen, you know, all the emails and, and so on. And uh, we'll just leave it up to there. So to answer that question, yes, I was that individual. Thank you for recognizing. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And I, I really hope that it helped inspire uh, trans individuals that there are people also, you know, trying to fight the fight. So hey, I saw your recent post in uh, whatever subreddit it was. And I'm wondering if there's anything I can do to help and systemic trans misogyny in our sometimes dumpster fire of a province. I am questioning where that individual is from because if it's Manitoba, I refer to it as an always dumpster fire, so whatever. Regardless though, all provinces have a responsibility to do better about trans misogyny, so things that can be done for anybody anywhere, and honestly, whether it's provinces or states or other countries or however it goes, territories and this and that and so on, the first thing that you can do is make noise as noise is necessary, where one of the, the biggest concerns is the hope that someone else will speak loud enough to do it for you too. But unfortunately, when I'm speaking, when I'm yelling, when I'm trying to raise awareness, yeah, I'm speaking louder than many others, but I'm still only one person, right? When people hear me, they hear one person, they don't hear a hundred voices. They hear one person that might speak louder than a hundred voices, but they still only hear one voice. So the most important thing when you want to go ahead and create change, when you want to address trans misogyny, when you want to address bigotry, when you want to address hate, when you want to create change, you have to participate. And sometimes participation doesn't need to be overtly visible, but it needs to be, you know, whether it's a support, you know, amplify on the side or so on, right? So for example, a great way to help share the message, like, share, subscribe, make sure that this message gets to your neighbors, gets to your peers, gets to your networks. If you have the opportunity to amplify the message, you are still assisting. So to create that noise when noise is needed, Needed and use as many mechanisms to amplify that noise as possible is one of the biggest steps behind that. The rest kind of depends on the person and the situation and the need and the project because you can't just go ahead and end trans misogyny with one thing. It is a structural system and it's much like many other systems too. I mentioned it in, in the episode that I was talking about the sources of transphobia. It's, it's like trying to topple politics, trying to topple uh, patriarchy. It's, it's a huge mountain to climb and then you can't just like overturn that in a weekend and be like, hey, we did it. It's it's just, that's not a thing. A systemic approach, depending on the task at hand, has different needs, which uses different assets from different individuals. And then, you know, people are able to assist accordingly. Ultimately, to sum it up in a nutshell though, about how to help as a, uh, perhaps a blanket answer to helping uh, put an end to trans misogyny is be accessible, be available and be passionate. Passion doesn't need to be 24 seven, but an understanding that the battle is 24 seven is one of the most important things. Those are things to keep in mind that, that staying committed to getting this project solved is uh, the, the first step to, to helping in that. And then again, right? Like if you're asking me directly about how to help, like I said, that when it comes to having more people assist with Hire Weller, when it comes to amplifying messages, or when it comes to editing videos, or when it comes to just helping grab other information so that it keeps more people engaged and so on, that could be a thing. If it comes to other communities, there could be local, you know, advocacy groups in the area that are looking for people that can network with and, and so on. There are many ways to go ahead and, and help. 
put an end to transmisogyny, especially when there's a dumpster fire other province, no matter where it is in Canada. The first step though, like I said, is is take it seriously, take it to heart, understand that it is a, a job, it's not a rewarding job, but it is a 24-7 thing that needs to be addressed and, and, and you can't just kind of pick and choose when it's time to care about it. Accessibility and availability might be one thing, but understanding that it is always happening is is certainly important to remember with that as well too so i saw your post on uh, another subreddit i hope you're safe the fuck jt crowd is slowly foaming at the mouth here in ontario i cannot imagine dealing with a larger concentration of them in winnipeg especially with a wannabe rush limbaugh calling the shots yes <laughs> i i do remember actually responding to this along the lines of it, to me it's the exact same crowd as a whole, specifically in the side of like the, you know, the, uh, the anti-Trudeau and whatever it is, all of those beliefs get muddled together, right? When it comes to, you know, whether it's COVID, when it comes to transphobia, when it comes to uh, whatever I've <laughs> spoken about it before, but they're, they're all one and the same. They're all one and the same. They're an incredibly self-serving group of, I'm not getting everything I want and then some regardless of the consequence of other individuals. Therefore, any other people who are in some sort of leadership decision are the worst people ever, even though I'm too blind and ignorant to recognize that I'm being taken along for a ride and grifted by, you know, other people amplifying, you know, hate support by politicians who go ahead and promise they're gonna take care of me because they re these are the ones that really care about you. Like, Whatever. And like, seriously, I don't even bother trying to isolate their differences because like they're all non-contributing zeros anyway. If you think about it, a, a non-contributing zero of one decimal point is just as useless as a non-contributing zero of 14 decimal points. So they're all the same. When it comes to safety though, Saves a relative word. It is what it is. My story is gonna get told either way. I, uh, I'm at peace with how my life goes. And should my safety ever be compromised, the people who are to be held accountable will be held accountable, I'm sure. So it's, uh, it is what it is. I, um, you know, I'm just gonna keep working on creating change and go from there. And thank you for your support. So that was the anecdotal stuff and, uh, or most of it, I should say. So the concern was Sport Manitoba airing an, an, uh, an erroneous ad from Bison Transport or promo or whatever that that housed toxic positivity. And as the concern was aired, it was then ignored and then amplified by just putting it onto YouTube now. For example, if it was a live event and it disappeared into space after that, kind of no harm, no foul sort of thing, like it happened, hey, we learned to do better and so on and so on. However, in this case, it is now ingrained in time. Now, I understand you can delete and edit videos and whatever, but the principle is not addressing the concern and then just putting it onto another medium for more people to see. So now let's address some of the questions and concerns. So one comment did an excellent job at identifying the nexus of the concern uh, because much of the campaign, of course, is, you know, storytelling, life experience, and so on and so on. And so to the focal point of the concern, however, is this. Is it that this, and they linked to the segment that I'm speaking about, portion of the Sport Manitoba seminar presentation, whatever, which was developed by Bison Transport, that said, for every one person that's rude or mean or a bully, there's gonna be 100 people that are gonna support you, and that's considered inaccurate, toxic, harmful, because there's not actually a 100 to one ratio of people in support of trans athletes and women's sports. Yes, that is the concern. Now, listen, if anyone thinks that I think that that is taken to the letter of the law, come on. Who do you think I am? That said, there is a responsibility to be responsible. That is an irresponsible segment of messaging because that is such an easy, wear the rose colored glasses. Hey honey, don't worry because if you're not getting taken care of nicely, you've got an army of people behind you who will. And when it comes to the quantity, yeah, you might not ever have 100 people, but there are people who rely on that type of language. Let's put it this way. Violent crimes against trans individuals has increased year over year, over year, over year, over year, over year, including homicides. New record last year, new record year before that, and I believe the record before that was in 2017, and the records in between were really, really close. It's not a bell curve, I'm telling you that much. When it comes to the, the rate of, of increased violence against trans individuals, why would that happen if not for the fact that more people are encouraged to come out. More people are encouraged to be visible. More people are encouraged to be proud of themselves. More people are told, hey, step out. You're 
safe, but the safety doesn't exist. The false promise of having a safe space to give the confidence to these individuals to put themselves into a vulnerable position without having the people who were promised to back them up actually be there, while intolerance isn't diminished, while intolerance possibly even exceeds the rate of visibility. So to, to kind of like encapsulate things, that's like shooting fish in a barrel if you're full of heat because you have more individuals of people you hate in an area that you can hate without being told to stop hating because there aren't people there to say, hey, stop hating. But all the people who are there being hated are told that people are around who don't hate them. Does that make sense now in terms of this idea of, hey, if you're bullied or if, if people are mean and, or whatever, don't worry, you've got people. That messaging was irresponsible, harmful because people rely on that messaging. And to even take it a step further, it is so easy to present the idea that the world is a fantastic place when you're not a victim of harm, right? The amount of times that I've heard so far, and if you watched that episode already that I was talking about a face-to-face, -face, challenging O'Toole, is like, we're in a better place than we were before. Okay, if you've always got Fs on your report card and then you finally come home with a D, yeah, that's success, sure, but is that something to f fully celebrate? Still a shitty report card. Still a lot of room to go. So if you want to go ahead and, and devalue the concern of growth because like, hey, we made some progress, isn't that great? No, there's a lot left to go. There's a lot left to go. Those things need to be understood that progress <laughs> doesn't equals success. That's not the same thing. This goes right back to what I was saying about the... The, the episode being about diversity, equity, and inclusion and totally missing the mark. Did the diversity, equity, and inclusion team review that and say, huh, this probably isn't appropriate for a situation like this considering the demographic we're trying to support. Don't have this type of support that you're insisting. And even if they wanted to use a different message than, you know, the 100 to 1 angle, which was empirically false, but that's, it'll be discussed later, I'm sure. To say a message along the lines of, it may not feel as if you have as much support as you have people against you, but know that when you do have support, that support that you do have is honest, because you are worth the support. You do have support, and know that Everybody who is against you isn't against you personally. But they are against everybody that they disagree with. The people who support you support you as an individual and support every reason what makes you unique and loved. Something like that. It is uplifting. It's inspirational. It's accurate. It's not overpromising anything. It also just makes people remember that there are a lot of haters out there, right? There are haters. And unfortunately, when you're on the receiving end of hate, sometimes it's easy to just not listen to anybody. So being affirmed that the people who are trying to pick you up legitimately are trying to pick you up because they care about you is a huge message. Instead of being like, whatever, we've got an army of 100, just turn around and just look, they're all here. I openly invite Sport Manitoba and Bison Transport to, again, please, Show me these 100 people that happen with every negative experience that I myself experience. And if you haven't yet, please take a look at that link in the description that takes you to the campaign. At the bottom of the campaign, or near the bottom of it, is a section that's called Let's Get Personal, which goes to now another, you know, comment that somebody had regarding the campaign as a whole. I support the spirit of the message. Inclusion in sport can't just be done in theory. Inclusion will only come when it is practiced by the sports organizations. That's the good part. That said, this post is silly. OP has made it 100% about themselves and I don't support that. That's the weird part. So how am I supposed to share a lived experience if I'm not speaking of myself? And how am I supposed to provide a relatable experience without giving lived experience to be like, hi, your messaging is wrong and here's how I can prove it. I have lived experience that I can use to show that this 100 to 1 ratio is wrong. So for example, if I'm talking about being on the receiving end of threats and harassment and abuse regularly, systemically, and so on, where are the 100 people every single time I'm on the receiving end of bullying, harassment, rude comments, and so on? I challenge Sport Manitoba and Bison Transport to share that. I've been excluded, blocked, ignored, overlooked, whatever, more in the last two years than I have in my entire life, ever since I came out as trans. According to Bison and Sport Manitoba, there's 100 people for every time that someone's mean or rude or a bully. So where are 100 people for every incident of being excluded? How do I share those types of information without using personal lived experience? If I just gave topical theories, it's just as useless as Bison saying, 
saying there's 100 to 1. Because they're not supporting it, so I'm at least giving something that supports it. So, so sorry that my lived experience might not be entirely relatable to everybody, but the least I can do is put it into a language that is understandable. Then people can then at least see how that overpromise is fundamentally harmful because it is wrong, it is inaccurate. And again, on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and especially so if it is empowering women, and especially so if Sport Manitoba truly stands behind the principle that trans women are women, then would that not be appropriate for them to think about the trans community, the support the trans community has, which is nowhere near enough, with 0.24% of Canadians identifying themselves as transgender over the age of 15, yet at least 5% of Canadians voted for political parties who amplify anti-trans policies. That alone is a 20 against 1 ratio of people who don't want to protect trans individuals or support them or see them exist versus a trans person. That is a 20 to 1 ratio against trans individuals and there's this affirmation of support of 100 people for? That's not how it works. And it's not including just the consideration when it comes to you know, liberal and NDP, and you people be like, well, they, they support trans individuals. Inclusion and acceptance are not the same thing. Just because you accept a trans individual does not mean that you're doing the effort necessary to give a trans person the assistance or the space to have a life that they have a right to. So 20 to one against. Bison in Sport Manitoba said 100 to one for. This is data I gave specifically to the, you know, whether it was the questionnaire during the live event and even during the event after. There is a four to one ratio of Canadians opposed to trans women participating in women's sports. Four to one ratio. There is a study and it was done not billions of years ago. The data was collected in July of 2021. The report was published in August of 2021. So again, for this affirmation of 101 people who support you when there's proof <laughs> of four to one against you in terms of sports, and that's all Canadians, which obviously then means that there's people outside of those who voted just for PPC or whatever too, statistically speaking. If you really wanna dig into that data even further, people who are like ultra firm on their decisions, it goes to a six to one ratio against trans individuals. So again, where's the 100 to one support? So for every person who chooses to exclude me from sports, where are the 100 people per people excluding me? Hey, Bison, hey, Sport Manitoba, show me. You said they exist, bring them. So how that's about me is beyond me. There was an individual who had a line that said, what did Sport Manitoba do wrong? It's not about wrong as in doing something malicious. It's doing something that is completely hypocritical to their affirmations. If Sport Manitoba is affirming diversity, equity, and inclusion, if Sport Manitoba goes ahead and is brave enough to post something on Trans Awareness Week about listening to the stories of trans athletes, when a trans athlete says, hi, your messaging is inaccurate and harmful, and here's actually data to back it up, so you should probably not promote this, and then they still promote it, I don't know if you want to not call that wrong, but that isn't right. And what's ultra frustrating about all of this, as I mentioned, that I was encouraged to, you know, to t take the episode in. For, for those who don't know or don't remember, I was sitting in <laughs> with Sport Manitoba's Two-Spirit, Transgender, Non-Binary Plus, Equity and Inclusion Committee since its outset. If I remember correctly, the invitation that I got for it was in February of last year. So if you've got an organization who's trusting my advice for pretty much a year, and when that same person says, you probably shouldn't be putting this out there because you're actually really, really wrong, here's your data. For, for myself to go ahead and, and provide guidance to motion change and so on. I don't want to say that I'm a somebody, but I'm not a nobody when it comes to these types of things. And so when I'm even saying to somebody from Sport Manitoba, this messaging is wrong and it should not be amplified, for it to then get pushed onto YouTube the following day really, 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 really kind of says, I wish I could explain the type of message that it feels like it's saying. It feels very, it feels very dismissive under the guise of uneducated. I really struggle with the, the, the constant pleas of cis individuals to be like, well, we're still learning, we're still understanding, and so on, because gender diversity, gender nonconformity, 
has been in recorded history for millennia. How much longer do we need to continue to wait to hear about being learned and understood? This isn't about learning and understanding. This is about finally recognizing that you're being told that you have to pay attention because it is ethically responsible. The easiest way to go ahead and do the ethically responsible things, listen to the people who are guiding you for ethically responsible actions. It's as simple as that. On a similar note, there was an individual who had a couple comments, but it was really interesting in the, well, it's the typical hide behind the keyboard stance, of course. Well, they'll go ahead and, and, and share thoughts. So it would be like, I would say more, but I don't want to get banned for hate speech. That's not really a parallel language to being supportive of trans individuals, because if you were supportive of trans individuals, you wouldn't be broadcasting any type of language that would be considered hate wouldn't it? To the point, I support trans rights, but I don't think women and trans women should be in the same category when it comes to sports. Trans women should fight for their own category the same way women had to, and I will support them every step of the way. So the first thing that I did when I addressed that, eventually, because I happened to notice that some of the comments in there work, no, you don't, and it's not like trans women or women, so there's no segregation. Um, but even with that, the first thing that I commented, as a matter of fact, was if you were going to be supportive of trans individuals, here is a blurb about the uh, the grammar. Trans woman is not one word. Trans is an adjective. Trans, transgender, and so on. Just the same as cis, cisgender, and so on as well. It is an adjective. It is a descriptor, right? It's if you're blending the words, you're suggesting that they are a different group of people. You are suggesting that they are either a higher or lower, you know, entity of that body. That individual ignored that twice, so that's not very supportive. And then additional, now let's just get into the meat and potatoes of what they're saying about the notion that trans individuals should get their own league. 0.24% of Canadians over the age of 15 have identified themselves as transgender in a study that was done in uh, 2018. To put that into perspective, that is 12 out of every 5,000 people. You see already where I'm going when it comes to the league thing? 12 out of every 5,000 people in Canada are trans. And now, it's, it's an unscientific number, but it's a very commonly accepted value that about 20 to 25% of adults are athletic. So now, just to make nice even numbers, three out of every 5,000 Canadians. And to kind of play nice when it comes to like dividing everything evenly, we will say one trans woman, one trans man, one non-binary individual, make those three. I'll speak for myself because the largest of the controversies in this conversation was about trans women. The one, maybe two out of every 5,000 individuals in Canada that is not even considering the idea that even though that these individuals are athletic, are they interested in team sports? Are they interested in the same sports? Just because you like baseball does not mean you like basketball. If you like volleyball, that's doesn't mean you like hockey. And, and living in Winnipeg, it'd be really kind of ignorant that I would need to drive to Hamilton to get to the One Nation team Friday game, right? Right? Kind of like when you see when it comes to you, when it comes to building a league. Like, sure, if you want to support us all of the way, then please help us find the logistics to make something like that happen. Oh, but wait, you want us to exclude ourselves, which is the exact opposite of inclusion, which is the exact opposite of supporting trans individuals. I had to take my glasses off because the mouth breathing in there was incredibly heavy. And of course, when I reply to that, I get, I'm not reading all of this, have a nice day. Of course not, <laughs> right? I've said before, you can't change the mind of people who have already made up their minds. All I know is there's a lot of growth for that individual. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in, uh, in and around that neighborhood, there was another individual who I've noticed have deleted all of their comments. Uh, a very turfy individual who um, doesn't seem to understand their words matter. And I kind of left it upon them to kind of reflect on it. I would much rather give the opportunity for ignorant people to see their own ignorance. And so an excellent example of that was this individual doing the typical, you know, women are having a difficult time because men and so on and so on and so on. And I don't disagree with that. Misogyny is an absolutely terrible thing. And there is a lot of work to do for men as a whole to be much more involved themselves when it comes to gender equity and, and so on. This individual would be going on and on about open sports and so on, but it would refer to their school's 
hockey team as the boys team, but affirming and asserting that it's an open league, but it would call it the boys team. If they're so assertive about this idea about men invading women's spaces, then why are you not addressing an open league, which would then be, you know, encompassing of all gender identities and gender expressions? Why would you call it the boys league then if you've got such a hard time with men taking over spaces? Pick your battles. So regardless of though, I'm not saying that this was an entirely positive experience because it is no surprise that there is a lot of hate and, and, and promotion of anti-trans beliefs in all of the uh, areas where I have posted these concerns and have actually seen the feedback because, you know, trans misogyny is a real thing, bigotry is a real thing, and um, people are ignorant. It's not always just cis people because, of course, many trans individuals can actually also be transphobic as a whole as well. And this was uh, honestly an incredibly frustrating individual to even read the words out of. It was incredibly privileged. To sum things up in a nutshell, this is a trans individual. I did an absolutely very brief review of uh, their posting history and it looks like they kind of recently have come out. And so I do empathize with the position of where they have been. I've mentioned in a previous story myself about how I needed to reframe my life to understand about how inclusion is you know, exceptionally important and so on and so on. But that being aside from the point that the, what they're amplifying is this idea of, well, you know, cis people don't like us, so we should just roll over and take it. And it's like, okay, so you're trans, but you, you encourage coddling the systems that exclude trans individuals. No, <laughs> sorry. Your opinion is valid, albeit wrong. Sorry, not happening. The meat and potatoes of the comment essentially was revolving around that and how um, society, you know, doesn't want trans individuals to be included with sports. Yeah, I know. I posted a study about that and I'm advocating against that. Thanks for telling me the things that I said. The apologist nature of, well, you know, the, the, the values of the whole are more important than the values of the individual. And that's the part where I had to pump the brakes on things and address very simply for them to have the opportunity to even understand that transitioning is a thing, let alone have access to the services necessary to transition, to have communities to speak to about transitioning and to live your best life. You would have never received any of those without somebody before you saying to people who don't feel it's necessary that it is necessary. Being able to transition, to be able to be medically and socially supported to transition would not happen if not for people, regardless if they are trans or not, advocating on not your present behalf, but your future behalf, that there is a responsibility for the majority to recognize the minority. And that privilege that was being exercised by that poster was pretty blatant. To be able to say that well, I'm toughing it out, so it's probably best if everyone else tries to tough it out too. That's not how it works. It might work for you, and that's great, and the best thing you can do for yourself then is shut up. Just live your life and keep your opinions to yourself, because inclusion and opinions do not work together. Inclusion and negotiation do not work together. Inclusion is unquestionable. That's how it works. To, to abuse their privilege in that sense, when the reality is, if we wanted to start including opinions into the conversation, the people whose opinions would have mattered the most were the people who could never actually be there. The trans kids who've lost their homes because of being excluded. The trans individuals who continue to live in the closet because they don't feel they will ever be included and so are fundamentally excluded, whether it's by practice or in principle, that they don't allow themselves to live their authentic life because they feel that they will be rejected. And the trans individuals everywhere who have lost their lives because of exclusion. Their opinions mattered way more than an individual who has managed to transition because of the work of other people before them. Those people who have lost their homes, lost their existing lives, and then lost their lives altogether. They don't need more people to wait to learn to accept. They need people to learn yesterday to accept now. The fight for inclusion, whether it's in sports or anything else, has to happen immediately and consistently. Because waiting for cis people to learn on their own will never, ever, ever, happen because the system is designed to be exclusionary. When it comes to something like sports, to think that sports is something that is nothing more than a scoreboard is as ignorant as it gets. Sports is a, a cornerstone of culture and community. Concerning about, well, we should attack the bathroom bills or whatever. First, that's in the US, but second, again, Sports is a cornerstone of culture and community. If you address inclusion with sports, what do you think happens in the bathrooms at sporting facilities? They are unquestionably inclusive. That is a start. The trickle effect that comes from sports creating change 
affects everywhere else. And so unfortunately, this individual chose to chime in. It was one of the most ignorant takes that I've actually read in my entire life. And believe me, I've seen a lot of just dumb takes and I've seen just a lot of like digital diarrhea, actually, literally. <laughs> but this was arguably one of the most from the heart ignorant things that someone has ever actually decided to try to articulate to other people. No, sorry. I acknowledge that there's a lot of learning that they uh, likely have to do for themselves, much the same as I had to learn how to uh, kind of like reframe my view when I started transitioning as well, because I mentioned that when I, when I was coming to terms with myself, I didn't understand why there was so much noise about inclusion because I just wanted to be quiet and in the corner and happy. Yeah, this has to happen. And I hope that this individual will eventually learn that too. Uh, somebody commented in a positive sense that provided we have conditional categories for sport, it's going to be hard to have unconditional inclusion for transgender athletes. Not wrong, but also not right. And maybe a solution is more funding for non-competitive sport with no gender-based categorization. Okay, so yes and no. When it comes to it's not hard to have unconditional inclusion, it actually is incredibly simple to have unconditional inclusion. You go, okay, it's unconditionally inclusive. Those are the things, period. Stop. What is difficult is the bravery to do it. That is the difficult part. Everyone wants to hide behind logistics. They want to hide behind whatever. They want to hide behind reasons why it's more tough than it needs to be. But when you're passionate about something, if you're truly passionate about anything, well, whatever it is, whether it's a hobby, whether it's a project for work, if you're truly invested in it, you find solutions. Sometimes they're fast, sometimes they take longer, but the reality is, is that if you're passionate about creating a solution, it's not about effort. It's about just getting the job done. And so the reality is, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's you adjust the systems accordingly to make it happen. That's it. That's how it goes. Because guess what? The systems got created to accommodate what they chose to accommodate. But if the system was created right out of the gate to be inclusive to everybody, not the preferred group, then it wouldn't be difficult. Overwriting things is not difficult. It's the bravery to overwrite it and deal with the, the with the backlash, deal with the controversy, deal with the questions, deal with the this, deal with the that, deal with the other thing. Those are the things that are difficult. And that is not a systemic thing, that is a personal thing, which oddly enough is supported by systemic failures. But. I digress. When it comes to more funding for non-competitive sport with no gender-based categorization, yes and no. What we also don't want is to isolate open sports. We want to encourage open sports, absolutely. Uh, I'm not taking that principle away, right? Because the idea of being able to play sport without questioning anything about anything, just show up, have fun, you know, do sport things because sport is good. And that, that also helps fundamentally build the visibility of, hey, we're just playing. Like we can all just play, this is fine. But at the same time, what that also kind of does is you're now building this one inclusive system while excluding an exclusive system. By doing that, you are actually just amplifying the problem in the first place by saying that we're not gonna attack and, and approach and try to fix a system that is not fundamentally designed to be inclusive, we're going to try to ignore it. But that's not how you fix things. Ignoring things doesn't fix things. And this is the part where now someone's going to yell at me about something somewhere. <laughs> For the record, right, remember, not detectable. So everyone, all you turfs, just go eat shit. And yes, testosterone is a driving factor of sports, uh, especially when testosterone is active in the body. And this goes back to what I continue to see about why sports needs to create that cultural change as early as possible so that individuals can build their lives in the bodies that are appropriate for their senses of self. And so with that, by having a consistently open league for all sports, just to kind of speak generally, what will end up happening is there will be a bias towards testosterone oriented bodies, aside from the very exceptional individuals who are using a like an estrogen based body. Because remember, it's just more than just the biology. There's just the, the, the sport sense, right? And the athleticism and the, the passion for the sport. There are a lot of elements, but fundamentally, aside from the exceptional estrogen based bodies, you will typically have a league that does become overrun by testosterone based bodies. And that is one of the reasons why women's leagues started for many sports and so on and so on and so on. So that is one of the reasons why it's important to not ignore the reality of division sports because that still needs to get acknowledged that there is a reason why divisions exist and then to get the divisions to understand trans men are men trans women are women stop worrying about now think about later it'll get fixed if you start working on it today i see the spirit of that and there was just kind of a couple little stars beside that that i wanted to to identify and even with that that uh, a comment that i almost forgot that i put so we've got let's say division-based sports and we've got open league sports 
What if my passion is for the division-based sports, right? I, I shouldn't be forced to learn to pr appreciate open-based sports because I really want to play over here. To throw, throw them out there, right? Let's just say ultimate and softball. I love both, <laughs> but like, I shouldn't have to learn to accept not playing softball, but I should be grateful that I get to play ultimate, right? It's, it doesn't work like that. There's another question of why, instead of making it a legal issue, they don't go ask, let's say, the women's teams in the Olympics if they would care if trans women were on their team or competed against them and go off their answer. I appreciate the idea of that. Remember that the athletes aren't the governing body, for starters. And second, opinions are not part and parcel of inclusion. Inclusion is a systemic understanding that people are valid. And once you start asking people for opinions, you're questioning their validity. And even if for whatever reason that ended up being a practice, that also means that every time that there is a new team, you are now entitling the new individuals to provide their opinion, which would then also mean that the rules will continue to change and adjust as every single time goes on and blah, 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 blah. When the reality of all of that is that their opinions don't matter anyway. <laughs> Just imagine if some teams go ahead and say, yeah, that's cool, no problem, which would happen. And then you've got other teams who argue that and say, this is a terrible idea, which would happen. Now you're adding that additional contest inside of things as well too. Unfortunately, like I said, the X factor is opinions are not part of inclusion. That's it. Whether it is Olympic teams, whether it's high level amateur athletes, whether it's professional athletes, they all have a responsibility to get vocal about inclusion. There are many athletes who are doing that for sure, but there is nowhere near enough athletes being vocal and visible about trans inclusion in sports. I should also comment really quickly to go back to the Olympics, just to use this exact example. As much as the Olympics are often recognized as the be all end all of, of sport, they're also not the only you know, the worldwide sporting event, right? There's whether it's Pan Am Games, Commonwealth Games, then you've got other organizations that have their own types of events and whatever too. So the Olympics don't speak for everybody and the athletes in the Olympics don't speak for everybody too. That said, IOC dropped the ball massively because they offered guidelines about how to be inclusive for trans individuals instead of mandates. If they created mandates about inclusion, that would force every international governing body for every sport that participates in the Olympics to then also equally mandate their systems so that they are, are inclusive and so on and so on and so on. Because as soon as you mandate things, that means that is the minimum expectation for everyone else too. And a very simple consequence of not following would be if you don't have a mandate of inclusion, which means that you're giving every athlete the best possible chance of, of succeeding and being included in the Olympics. If you're not being inclusive, then that means we have uh, the responsibility to not allow you to participate because you are not sending the potential of your best athletes forward. And that is not right. Pretty simple. And just like I was saying about being easy, that is very simple to do. The bravery and courage to do that, that is a completely different story. I wonder what will happen to the Olympics and other major sports leagues in the next 10 to 15 years with non-binary inclusion. Me too. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I would love to know. I'm doing the best that I can to help in, in places that I'm able to, to help ensure that there is non-binary inclusion. Uh, even when it comes to the committee with Sport Manitoba, I remember when I got the invitation, I was told that, that I would be helping provide lived experience as a trans woman athlete and there would be a trans man on the committee as well. And I asked, do we have a non-binary athlete? Because I'm not gonna wing it for them. Uh, it's not right for me to go ahead and get really salty at the cis community trying to wing it for me. And then I get to wing it for, you know, for a non-binary individual. I don't have non-binary lived experience, so I can't speak on what the, the priorities are or aren't. I've mentioned before about how my birth certificate had a driver's license and passport, they all have X's on them. And the reason for that is because I know I've got the courage to challenge systems that require M or F or on an ID. And then I get to go, well, this is really awkward now, isn't it for you? <laughs> actually in the summer as a matter of fact is a great example you know hey Taylor we need you to fill out this registration form I'm like okay cool we'll update your registration form otherwise it's gonna get kind of messy now won't it and it got updated and uh, it was great to actually get feedback from the organizer of the event from other individuals other athletes non-binary individuals who were able to provide a, a registration form that was actually authentic to themselves it's not it's not right to expect somebody to be forced to use a gender marker that is not congruent with 
their identity. And when it comes to non-binary inclusion in sport, uh, I do know that it is fantastic that there is more representation of non-binary individuals at high-level sport. Quinn is obviously a fantastic example I can think of right off the top of my head. And if I remember correctly, in the Summer Olympics, there was a skateboarder from the States. And I believe in the Paralympics, I believe somebody medaled too, um, all non-binary individuals. Uh, and so that's fantastic to help, you know, provide that added visibility. And by the way, to that turf I was mentioning not terribly long ago, who tried throwing something at me along the lines of, you know, when it comes to trans women in sports, about how there was some rapper in the UK who ended up you know, identifying as a woman and, you know, broke a record for a deadlift or something like that. But Laurel Hubbard ended up competing in the Olympics as a trans woman and uh, got beat by cis women. So I see where you're going with that. And I guess that's part of the reason why they deleted all their uh, posts. But anyway, back to the uh, non-binary athletes. I would love to see a, a solution. I'm not going to speak on what I feel is the right solution because I don't have that internal feeling about non-binary athletes. What I've been advocating for so far is to let non-binary athletes declare what division they feel most comfortable in. I know it's not a perfect solution because what that also requires is a reframing of division language because saying men's and women's is very definitive. And for a non-binary individual to, to essentially declare themselves to be like a man or like a woman is not really congruent with non-binary. I feel that reframing division language to, I don't even want to say male and female, but at least like mask and femme, like masculine and feminine would be more inclusive. Like this is the part where I'd love to have non-binary individuals take the lead about that. I support whatever decisions they feel is right for when it comes to the sports there, because I believe it's it, the first step is, is reframing language to create a more inclusive environment. There was a nod to the idea of, you know, should there end up being enough individuals to have a division of non-binary athletes is possible. Again, I'm not I'm not dipping my toes in that one. I'm going to let a non-binary athlete say what they feel is most appropriate. My concern is that would amplify segregation, but if that's what they also feel most welcome with, hey, cool. Like I said, my concern when it comes to the notion of segregation is depending on the political attitude if that started to happen, was that you'd be getting bigots saying stuff along the lines of, look, they want to be separated from us anyway. And then blah, 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 blah. We don't want to disrespect the identity and authenticity of a non-binary individual. We also want to maintain the integrity of sport. I'm firm on maintaining the integrity of sport. I was alluding to earlier about how, you know, when it comes to open leagues versus div division leagues, there's a reason why division leagues exist. And it's to essentially maintain a competitive environment. That's that's the part where a non-binary athlete has their own their own internal responsibility, just the same as, as, as every other individual too. I have my own internal responsibility as well. And so that's the part where I I would love to know more about what, what the overall mindset of non-binary athletes is. I have had my eyes on it because I really would like to see how that evolves as a, um, you know, as, as a, a huge element of inclusion because it is, it is a different conversation than, than trans athletes like trans men, trans women. I, I feel it will be an absolutely massive factor in sports in the next decade, two decades or so. Uh, and even anecdotally, I remember in this conversation that this person and I were having, they were mentioning about uh, sports uh, when it comes to hockey, obviously sports, right? But when it comes to something like hockey and even women participating in hockey, and I, I do feel that'll happen soon enough. And for any other reason, the hockey is less hitting, like they're still hitting, and I'm not saying that women can't take hits, but that was the, the defense of, you know, big players hitting da 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 da. I've always been the argument when it comes to hitting. If you're hitting a player, you don't have the puck, which means you're chasing the game. Like, I totally understand the flow of hockey. I am, you know, born and bred Winnipegger for 40 years. I've, you know, I've enjoyed my hockey. But I know full well that when it comes to the sport itself, in North America, 
Hitting is certainly part of the game, but it is not anywhere near as, as utilized overseas. That's something to stay mindful about when it comes to the style of game, and I totally get it, rank size, you know, player size and speed and da 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 but that doesn't mean that people don't evolve. It really wasn't that long ago that they really started cracking down on headshots when it, when it comes to fighting. Those things have evolved as well too, so it's not to say that something like just the on-ice experience doesn't change, and even if that won't change, even if hitting continues to be part of the game, especially a high speed game and so on and so on, that doesn't mean that women can't play. Women are exceptional players. One of the biggest reasons why there's nowhere near as many women in the NHL, for example, is because of the funding. It's not because of the ability, it is because of the funding and the, just the general ecosystem. I love watching women's hockey because you can see, even on teams like Canada and US, where they're clearly just a, a, an entire mob of, of exceptional players, but you still see some of those players stand so far ahead of the rest of the team, and you can only wonder where they would be if the system that they play in wasn't as limited as it was compared to the systems that get people into the NHL easier. Some of these players have such extraordinary talent and they are limited by a very patriarchal, misogynist system. Give that time. I don't doubt for one second we're going to start seeing more women in sports. I'll say within the next 10, 15 years, just use the same time frame. You're, you're finding women on commentary and uh, going to be women refs. And then, uh, you know, there have been women um, players. I still remember getting Manon's uh, hockey card way back when. And uh, that was so exciting, right? To, even though it was a preseason game, to see a, a woman play in net with the Tampa Bay Lightning um, was such an inspiration and um, and even when it comes to the all-star games right to see uh, ladies go ahead and you know participate with that and especially when it comes to fastest skaters and whatever oh the speed and so anyway like hockey for example is evolving I'm not gonna ever promise anything but this um, this will be a change that I believe strongly we'll see come soon enough so uh, and it's long overdue just one last one. It's a little anecdotal here. Our business is treated the same way here as they are on the stage, which is to say they essentially have personhood. For example, Hobby Lobby doesn't provide birth control because the owner is religious and it's against his beliefs. Uh, Hobby Lobby as well lost a case because of preventing a trans employee from using the bathroom. Uh, that was recent, so their ownership is certainly very firm in their ways. I took notes on this one, and so in this case I did do a little bit of reading about that question because I have an idea what it would be in my head, and I ended up finding a ruling for something similar-ish in Quebec that I think is related and I haven't seen anything really related since and I'm not gonna lie there's a lot of multi-syllable words and I love big words but I'm not a lawyer <laughs> so uh, this got a lot for me to read but I think I've got the meat and potatoes of it so there was a school in Quebec that it's a Jesuit Catholic high school. And in 2008 in Quebec, there was a provincially mandated course called ERC, which was an ethics and religious culture course, which, like I said, mandated requiring schools to teach basic traditions and symbolisms of a variety of religions. So the most important part of that is variety of religions. Essentially, it was to show with neutrality ethics to go ahead and teach people of different people. The challenge that Loyola High School had was that it was preventing them being a Catholic high school for promoting their beliefs the way that they wanted to, but being told to promote the beliefs of other religions as a mandated course. Long story short, I believe the way that I understand the final ruling after his superior court then went to the Supreme Court, and I think there was an appeal in there too, I think the final ruling was along the lines of, okay, Loyola, you're right. You do have the right to practice your faith and, and promote your religion in your organization because the school is a business. However, you still must also teach ERC. What the ruling ultimately said was, it's not this is the only faith you can preach. It's that if you want to preach your faith, you must also be inclusive to others. I think is kind of the, the X factor of all of that. Because during the conversation that I was having with this uh, with this individual here, like with Hobby Lobby, if, if Buddy didn't want to sell birth control because it's against his religion, that is kind of religious discrimination. <laughs> 
But if that also means that he's not serving people with birth control, he's also not serving anybody birth control. He's not saying, I'll only sell birth control to you or you or you or you or you, which is kind of weird and paradoxical, but I think you understand where I'm kind of going with that. Let's throw Hobby Lobby out the window. Let's talk gay cakes, <laughs> right? So what was it? Gay cakes or gay donuts or something like that? If you don't want to serve gay cakes, then you're not serving any cakes. Because if you choose to not serve a type of cake to an individual because you don't believe in their rights, that's discrimination. If you choose to say, okay, well, if I'm not allowed to serve cakes to people that I don't disagree with, then I guess I'm not serving cakes to anybody. That is kind of a idiot move as a business. But again, you're not discriminating because you're not providing a service to anybody even though that the root of your choice was because of discrimination. It's like, I, I, I don't want to be in trouble, so I'm just going to avoid the entire thing instead of just learning to let my business operate as, as an entity instead of a belief. And as a matter of fact, another article that had a great line here, since a corporate organization does not demonstrate a sincere belief as an individual, it must show that its belief or practice is consistent with its purpose and its operation, i.e. a church or a faith-based school is, for example, something that would be recognized as practicing a belief, but a cake factory, that's not a place of worship. So does Canada do something like that? I guess the answer is kind of close, but not entirely the same as what Hobby Lobby did. Like I said, I I believe that kind of the, the MO is you can make a decision, but that decision has to not be discriminatory to anybody. If you're going to render a service or a good, right, then that service or good gets rendered to everybody following the practices of inclusion, where if you choose to segregate individuals from your services or goods or deny them services or goods because of who they are, that is a discriminatory practice. If you have trouble doing that, then just withdrawing that entire service altogether is the out, I guess is the easiest way to put it. Um, to not be discriminatory because you're not offering that service or good to anybody. There are businesses who are inclusive who would be more than happy to pick up that market. So let's just go back to the gay cakes thing. If Buddy's not going to sell any cakes because he doesn't want to get into the trouble of not selling gay cakes, there's going to be a cake shop just down the street to be like, hey, I sell all cakes, right? Even the gay ones, right? Come on home, <laughs> right? So while dude loses business because... He chose to be discriminatory and just wants to, you know, uh, screw the system. Someone else is going to profit on their ignorance. So I, I hope that answers that question. I did my best to kind of like glean through it. But like I said, the, that was a lot to read. <laughs> Those are really a lot to read and, uh, and, and try to make sense of. But I, I think I got it. This was a long and scrambly episode. Thank you for making it through. I hope that with, uh, as I mentioned, that campaign that I was discussing earlier, that some of these answers to some of these comments help make sense. Please make sure to take a look at that campaign if you have not seen it yourself. And when it comes to trans inclusion in sports and, and whatnot, remember, I've said this more than enough times in more than enough places already, that diversity and inclusion do not go hand in hand with opinion or negotiation. If you're supporting trans individuals, you're supporting all trans individuals for all their endeavors because they are valid and they have a right to achieve all of the same goals that you do too. So remember that if you are supporting trans individuals and you continue to advocate the principle that you do support trans individuals, you support them entirely. Inclusion does not have opinion as part of the decision-making process, right? Right. Uh, and again, thank you for providing me space to have a moment of grieving, um, which I felt was uh, really, really honest. And look, everyone got to see me cry for a little bit too so hey look taylor actually does have emotions that are more than happy and mad i i really appreciate having that space for that and i appreciate you for giving me that space too and remember that i'm not ignorant to the fact that it has been an incredibly difficult last couple of years um for 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 so many people and in so many ways and and remember grieving doesn't always have to be about an individual you know whether it could be uh you know it could be work it could be money it could be lifestyle it could be whatever it may be and so grief comes in so many ways remember that grieving is a process not a procedure and also remember if you're ever struggling sometimes it may feel that things are more difficult than possible with a solution but solutions are available sometimes solutions won't be right in front of you sometimes you actually might even need to do a little work to find the solutions but know that the solutions the support and the systems do exist so long as you also put the work in to find it 
you are supported when you're trying to overcome anything that is difficult. It is not an easy journey right now, regardless if you're trans or not. Keep a very mindful approach on what you want to do and how you want to do it, and you will find success, you will find support, you will find happiness, you will find achievements, you will find everything that you're looking for so long as your passion for what you want stays in that exact same area. Like I said, this was a long and scrambly episode. I'm not gonna wrap this up really quick with a reminder, check the links also if you haven't seen that campaign already. Speaking of campaigns, definitely take a look at that Hire Weller campaign. As always, make sure your voice gets heard so that organizations, businesses, and communities in your area learn to amplify and, and, and respect their social and ethical responsibilities and prevent abuse against 2SLGBTQIA plus individuals. Remember that takes less than a minute. Name, email address, postal code, hit send. There's a pre-made letter that's going to go ahead and get sent to elected officials in your area automatically, which is the best part. And then, of course, like, share, subscribe, follow, forward, whatever it may be. I'd love to be able to see this reach more and more people every single week. I absolutely love seeing more subscribers. I love, you know, hearing feedback, comments, and so on. So please make sure to stay with, uh, with me when it comes to communicating more about this. Next week, I'm going to get back into the grab bag, get back into your questions that you have about this too. Those are always really exciting to help answer. And uh, you know what? I think I'm going to wrap up on this. I hope everyone has a great rest of your night. And as always, have a great rest of your week. And I will talk to you then.